start out asking Shannon a couple questions, and in 20, 25 minutes, we'll open it up for your questions as well. So congratulations on the book. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's got a great cover. It's out there. So to start off, the title, The Globalization Myth, can you explain that? Is globalization a myth? Sure. Well, first, I just want to say thank you so much for having me here, and it was great to join uh, the World Affairs Councils. Uh, and I want to give you God Jessie's bio, um, which is very illustrious, and she's doing great things. But back when she was a wee girl, um, she interned for me at the Council on Foreign Relations. So she did some great research on this book as well. So I, you know, I could ask her the questions, actually. Um, but, um, but let's talk about this. So the title is The Globalization Myth. And, and what do I mean by that? And so you know, I got interested in this subject. I was doing this project on North America for the Council on Foreign Relations and diving into you know, issues of security and trade and energy and people and the movement around North America. And when I got into the economic part, I started talking to CEOs and other companies and, and noticing this you know, lattice work of commercial exchanges that was really underneath a lot of, of the production that was happening, manufacturing. Um, and it really piqued my interest. And I remember going to, to my boss at the Council on Foreign Relations, Richard Haas, and saying, I think I know what my next book is going to be about. I want to write about this you know, phenomenon that nobody talks about that's kind of wonky but really undergirds the global economy, and that is international supply chains. And you know, at the time, which is probably 2017, 2018, he's like, OK, that sounds really boring. <laughs> uh, and he's like, who's ever heard of a global supply chain? So um, the sad part of our life is everybody's heard of them now, um, and we deal with them day to day. Um, but it is this really interesting phenomenon. And so to get to your point, the globalization myth, as I started looking at these patterns in trade and investment internationally that have been over this last 40 years, so 1980 to today, roughly, you know, started noticing um, and looking at this data that globalization is just not as much of a juggernaut or all-encompassing and penetrating as it's often portrayed. Uh, and in fact, there are only about two dozen countries that have seen their economies transformed uh, by trade over these last 40 plus years. Um, and by that I measure it as you know, trade as a percentage of GDP, so as a part of their economy has doubled or more. And there are dozens more, there's almost 90 countries that have seen trade as part of the economy just stay the same or even decrease. So there are a number of countries that have deglobalized, frankly, over these last 40 years. And so in that the globalization myth is just, it's not as big and encompassing and, 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 and important for at least so many people living in this world, so many countries in the world, as, as we may think. So that really cuts against almost everything we're hearing today in politics. That's quite the finding. Um, if you were to look at a map of, say, trade flows in the last 30, 40 years, this round of globalization, for the countries that have globalized, what do those flows look like? Where are they going? Where are they coming from? So one of the interesting things is, well, not that many countries have, have been involved, when countries have been involved, and we have seen a huge increase in trade. It's not to say that we have not seen internationalization. And you know, just to throw out a couple numbers, in 1980, trade around the world was about $2 trillion. Today, it's $22 trillion. So you've seen a huge increase. But the countries that participated, the countries that opened up, the other sort of myth, I would say, or, or thing that I think is not as understood is that when you see trade, when you see money go abroad, it doesn't normally go to the other side of the world. Um, now, of course, we can point to examples of companies that are global, that source from 60 different countries, countries like, or companies like Boeing, say, or you know, Coca-Cola, things like that. There are global companies, of course. Um, but there are thousands of others, or even tens of thousands of others, um, that when they decided to go abroad, either to look for suppliers or to look for customers, they really just went next door. And so what you have seen is that trade does not go as far as one would think. Um, and you know, one statistic that brings it home, at least to me, is the average good that goes across a border, so the average good that's traded, goes about 3,000 miles. That is roughly the distance between New York and Los Angeles. That does not get you to Shanghai. Um, and so that, there's more regionalization. So when you combine this, that not that many countries were actually involved in this round of globalization. And when they were involved, they went nearby when they went international. And what you've gotten over this last 40 years is the rise of three big manufacturing and trading regions. Uh, a European one, 
an Asian one and a North American one. And most of the other countries around the world, in Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, South Asia, they've been left out of this phenomenon. Um, so you have these big regional hubs, uh, and you know what I argue in the book is, for various reasons, and, and I go through this um, in, in various chapters, Europe and Asia have integrated or regionalized much more than North America has, and I would argue that that is a big part of what we perceive as their commercial advantage and, and some of our challenges here in the United States today. Great, so what are the reasons that this globalization has really been a regionalization? Why is trade looking like this today? So there are a lot of reasons, and you know, we think about it in our everyday lives, you know, this idea, sure, you could go anywhere, right? You have big container ships that you know, cross the oceans, and you have you know, all the, the smartphones that we all have and technology that can connect us with anywhere in the world, but it's not as easy as that, right? You, the, you run a business, and if you read you know, any sort of management textbook, you need, businesses need to be built on trust. You need to trust the other people on the other side. You need to understand the people on the other side. You need sort of a culture within um, your business, um, and some of that just dissipates distance. It dissipates because languages are different, customs are different, sometimes legal structures are different, so you have to add on new legal teams and the like. Time zones do make a difference. I mean, now you all have been on Zoom, and you know you can zoom into a to a chat that's happening in China, but it's really exhausting because it's at six in the morning or it's you know 10 p.m. at night, so you don't very often. Right? These things really do seem to matter, and you know they matter. I'm giving you little examples, but um, it matters in a more systematic way. And interestingly, McKinsey did this study of of hundreds of of companies, and they call this. This was before COVID. Um, they call uh, this, this cost to distance, they call it actually, they have a term for it, they call it the globalization penalty. And what they find is that when companies go abroad, their profits go up, um, but the further they get away or the more spread out their operations get, then their profits go back down. So they, their margins go back down. And so there is a cost to this distance. Um, the other thing that happens, and, and you know, we can talk more about supply chains, international supply chains, um, and right now, you know, the world, we're talking about moving supply chains for various reasons, which, you know, if people are interested, we can talk about. Um, but once you get things set up, they're pretty sticky, right? And you think about in your own life, you get into your own routine. You know, you go to the same coffee shop, and then you go to the same grocery store, and you know which aisle things are in. And businesses aren't all that different. You go, you get a supplier, and you know that they're on time, and, and that you can, you can trust them to deliver. And if you need a little bit of leeway, you have a relationship. And so... The idea of just saying, okay, we've been producing in China, but now we're just going to go produce in, in Mexico or in the United States, you have to find all those people. You know, I need this part, and who's going to make it, and do I trust them, and, and, and can they, will they deliver on time, and what if I need a little extra time to pay my bill, or we can, do we have a relationship where we can trust each other? And that's, that takes the cost a lot, right? It costs a lot psychically, but it costs a lot in terms of, of you know, dollars and, and cents. And so there, once these things get set up, and they got set up regionally for various reasons, um, they're hard to dislodge unless you have big, uh, you know, earth-shattering events like COVID, say. <laughs> yeah. So talk a little bit more also about what's being traded right now. I know you point out in the book the rise of intermediate good trading, and what does that look like? That? Yeah. You know, we've had in the world, um, we've had lots of waves of globalization over the, you know, the last many hundreds of years, even, even thousands of years, one could say. Um, and what's different about this last round, sort of post-World War II round, what's different here is in the past, it was much more raw materials and finished goods that, that moved around the world. So, you know, if you guys, if anybody took Economics 101 in, in college, you would get, you know, a, a textbook and, and they would lay out these theories, like Ricardian theories, and it'd say, you know, Spain trades wine and, and Britain sends back, you know, textiles or apparel. And that's how, that's how you know, they would set it up and explain to you global trade or, or international trade. Um, that's not what's traded today, really. And so 75% of what crosses borders is what economists call intermediate goods. So these are the inputs, the pieces and the parts that go into a car or a blender or an iPhone or a dress or a suit or the microphones, any of the stuff, or this bottle of water, right? These are the things that are crossing, not the bottle of water itself, but the pieces and the parts and the petrochemicals and the, this parts that go into it. 
Um, and that's very different, right? And that is, so the real hallmark of this round of globalization is supply chains, that you have divided up the way things are made, the, the processes are divided up across borders, across companies and across borders. Um, and that has brought um, an inc in a, in a bounty of benefits, right? It has allowed economies of scale. So, you know, someone makes just the plastic or just one part of that petrochemical and they can do it in huge um, amounts that's at very low prices but high quality. Um, it's brought specialization, so they focus in on one thing and there's innovation in that specialization. Um, it has allowed different, you know, comparative advantages. So, you know, some places have, you know, particular kinds of labor or labor prices. Some they have particular access to natural resources or access to financing. There's all these kinds of things where you, when you bring countries together across the making of something, you can make it uh, at a higher quality. Um, often you get innovation, um, but you can also bring it at a lower price. Um, and that is that is very different, I would say, than you know, the beginning of the 20th century, when you also had a wave of globalization in the lead up to World War I. This one is very different because of these supply chains. And, th and so that is what, you know, what spurred me in this project and to think about it over these last five or six years. Um, but also is what's driving today's, you know, when we talk about businesses and jobs and geopolitics and tariffs and all these kinds of stuff, this is what is underlying all that and is, is being affected by it. That's an amazing uh, percentage that is intermediate goods. It's a huge amount. Um, so that paints a good picture, I think, for everyone of goods production. Is regionalization also happening for services production? It's starting to. Um, and you know, one thing we've seen over the last 40, 50 years is goods have gone abroad and these pieces and parts, services have been a bit slower to go abroad. Um, some services because you need to be in the room with somebody to do it, um, part of it. But also there are more barriers to services going abroad. Just you need licenses. You know, if you're gonna be a lawyer, you have to be certified by the local bar. I mean, even here in the United States, you can't practice law in, you know, in DC if you the bar in New York City, right? There's sort of, there's divides up there. So we even have divides here that goes again uh, on the international side. Um, you've started to see some of this opening up. Um, and in fact, that's the fastest growing part of international trade uh, is the services side. Um, interestingly too, for people who are wonky and, and are interested in this, um, services that it, when you look at what people export, quote unquote export, um, education is an export and not just you know, uh, you know, online services, but if an international student comes and it studies at American University here in DC, that's considered an export by the United States. Um, sort of interestingly there, same with tourism. You know, if, if uh, foreigners come and they tour, you know, they spend money here in Washington DC, seeing all the monuments, going to the museums, that's, a, that's an export of the United States. So actually the US has a surplus in services. Um, one, because we send out lots of, you know, consultants and accountants and, and other content and, you know, iPhone, um, uh, you know, intellectual property and that kind of stuff, which is services out there. But we also have so many tourists who come here and, and students who come here and other things that spend money here and that's considered um, services. So one interesting thing with services is you would think lots of these services because they're digital, because they're patents or royalties, um, you would think this, okay, so maybe trade isn't, isn't global, it's more regional because you have to physically move something and it costs money to move stuff. But, but services, why, how, why couldn't I just send my intellectual property or teach my class and, and people in China would, why would, they, why would more people in Mexico watch it say then, well, if I'm teaching it you know, here in the United States. Um, but services too tend to have this regional bent, mm -hmm. interestingly. Um, and in part it is that um, Europe is so self-contained in this area. They you know, make things together, they um, service each other, and then they buy things from each other. So you have kind of an internal um, movement there that makes it very regional. Um, but you see this as well as Asia and, and in the United States as well, is that when economic activity is across borders, it's much more likely to happen even in services with those that are nearby. So we have this picture of global trade, regionalization, the globalization myth. I want to go to the micro. And you start the book out actually not with the global, but with Akron, Ohio, which is where you grew up. And right now there's a lot of dialogue about why the Akrons of the United States of America are kind of facing tough times. And a lot of people blame 
globalization or perhaps regionalism, but what do you say to those people? Talk to us about what it was like in Akron and is trade to blame for Akron's difficulties? Definitely. So I grew up in, in Akron, Ohio. Um, it was, for those that don't know, it was the rubber capital of the world, um, or, or like to think of itself as that. And indeed, in the 1950s and 60s, it was making you know one out of every two tires in the world. It had all these other industries along with it. It was a booming town. I mean, I talk about in the um, in, in the book, you know, it had you know it has over a dozen golf courses. I mean, there were sort of that was the, the way things things were run, and you know, Goodyear and Firestone had their own, you know, basketball teams and baseball teams. I mean, it was really kind of a booming town um, in my in my parents uh, when they were growing up. Um, and then when I was growing up, it was hitting the skids. It was a lot of those things disappeared. Uh, the tire industry in the 1970s and into the early 80s. Uh, was facing competition from abroad. It was facing better technology. Frankly, the Japanese and the French and the Germans had better technology, different kinds of tires that lasted longer and were safer. Um, and the last tire came off of an assembly line in Akron, Ohio in 1982. And the tire companies that had been there, you know, Goodyear and Firestone and Goodrich and General Tire were sold, um, almost all of them, to, to international competition. And this, I would say, having grown up there, and my family still lives there, um, the people would say, you know, this was the poster child for, you know, the victim of globalization, right? These other people came in and, and, and Akron uh, suffered as, as a result. Um, and I would say that I don't think that's actually the story. Uh, and one of the parts that we miss in that telling is that I would say actually what Akron suffered from was not globalization, but limited regionalization. And what they were doing in the 70s and 80s was competing against Japanese tire makers and car companies that had become Asian in nature and were benefiting from outsourcing and, and tying together various countries' production in Thailand and South Korea and Taiwan and Japan that allowed them to, one, be more innovative, um, but then also have lower prices, so they're competing against that. The same thing was happening in Europe. They're competing against you know, Michelin, which was a French company, Continental, a German one, um, but that had the whole European community, what it was called at the time, uh, to sell their products so they were able to get economies of scale and, and lower prices. And Akron was on its own. NAFTA was a decade away, so it didn't have the sort of economies of scale that one could have had with, with other countries, and it was unable to compete and ended up the industry ended up failing. And I would compare this actually to um, a different example here, which is uh, Cummins Engines, which is, a, which is an engine company. It's based in Columbus, Indiana, um, a town not all that unlike Akron. Um, founded between the world wars, it was you know, a tinkerer who created this engine. Um, it grew significantly in the post-war period, but it too, in the 70s and 80s, hit hard times. It was facing uh, more efficient, um, better made, and lower cost Japanese engines. So they were losing out uh, to many, you know, in, in the, you know, GM and, and Ford and others were buying from, from others. Um, they too were sort of on the ropes. And in many ways, NAFTA saved them. When NAFTA came along, Cummins was able to recuperate. It was able to move some production and assembly to Mexico so it could lower its price and be able to compete with Japanese engines in terms of orders. Uh, it had actually the Mexican market opened up to it, which it had never had access to, and Cummins became the biggest engine maker for truckers in Mexico, which allowed them to build and expand a big plant in, in New York City, or not New York City, in upstate New York. Um, and so Cummins now is a thriving company. It's much bigger than it was in the 1970s and 80s, but precisely because it could take advantage of regionalization, both in terms of its ability to control costs and, and get economies of scale, and its ability to access more markets than just the U.S. market, which is where I think the U.S. tire makers had, had flailed at the time. So I think there's a story here of the lack of reaching out to neighbors leading to, to a loss for places like Akron, um, where they could have had, had more opportunities if they had looked outward. So why is it that of these three hubs, Europe, Asia, North America, North America has been dragging its feet in regionalizing? Part of it, I think, is the United States has for so long been the biggest consumer market in the world, um, the you know, most advanced and industrial economy, so we didn't think we needed partners. <laughs> you know, we, could, we could go it alone. And when you look at the 50s, 60s, early 70s, 
we were pretty much the only game in town, town being the global economy, because Europe was trying to rebuild itself from the war, Japan, the same thing, and so we, ha we had it pretty easy. Um, all of a sudden then, other economies, they recovered, they, they got into this, and they began regionalizing, and we didn't. And you know, we have lots of benefits here. We're still the biggest market in the world. We have the privilege of the dollar being the global currency, so we get a little bit more leeway than a lot of other countries do who have you know, stricter budgets and things like that, where they have to, have, they have to make ends meet. Um, those sorts of things have benefits, so we haven't had to reach out, I think. But I think it has cost us. Um, and particularly, you know, we talk about communities that have lost industry or lost jobs that have been hollowed out. I think the lack of reaching out to our neighbors and engaging in trade and really not just trade but in creating supply chains and regional supply chains have cost us whole industries. And the interesting thing is that given the reality of international supply chains, given the reality that other countries are regionalizing and have regionalized, when a factory moves to Mexico, is it, the basic line is not all trade is, e is created equal for US-based companies and US-based workers. So when a, com when a factory opens in Mexico, that factory is much more likely to buy from suppliers in the US. So these international supply chains, that 75% of trade that goes around, that's not a finished good, that's, that's pieces and parts. That Mexico factory is going to buy parts from the United States. Um, and you know, one statistic that you can sort of see this, um, when something is imported from Mexico, on average, 40% of that product was actually made in the United States. Um, so that's a huge amount that was US suppliers, US-based factories, US workers. When a factory opens in China, almost nothing is going to be bought from US suppliers. They're gonna buy from suppliers in Taiwan or South Korea or Malaysia or Thailand. They're gonna buy nothing from the United States. And there the statistic, you know, something that's imported from China, less than 5% of that value added was made in the United States. And most of that are things like the, I, the intellectual property in the iPhone, right? It's not a physical factory, right? It's, I mean, there's some tech engineers and technicians and stuff that are employed, but it's not a factory. And so as you look at those numbers, trade with Mexico and Canada is much better for US-based companies and better for US workers because you create these, you create jobs, you create our orders. Um, the other thing that we benefit from, I would say, with trade with the US and Mex or Mexico and Canada particularly is States, weirdly, I think, but, but, but the reality is we have very little access to global markets in preferred terms. So we have free trade agreements with less than 10% of the world's GDP. Um, you know, Mexico and Canada find lots of free trade agreements, and they have free trade agreements or preferred access, tariff-free access, and lower regulations and things with almost 60% of the world's GDP. So if we can supply factories that are based in Mexico, we can have preferred access to 60% of the world's GDP. We will face, our, our, our companies and our workers will face lower tariffs and the like uh, because they're exporting through Mexico or through Canada than if we tried to do it ourselves. And you know, let me just give you one example where it's a real cost. So um, the United States did not join the TPP, which is, CP, TPP, which is a big acronym for the Comprehensive Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is basically a trade agreement with lots of countries on the Pacific side of, on both sides of the Pacific. So, you know, Canada, Mexico, Chile, um, and Peru, and then, and then lots of Asian countries. So today, because that agreement has come into force, um, if we sell beef to, if we try to sell beef to Australia or Japan or the other countries that are involved, it will cost 12% more, we'll pay a 12% tariff, while Mexico and Canada will pay no tariffs. And that is a profit margin, 12% is a huge profit margin. It means that we will really not sell beef to those. And many other, that's just one example, but there are many other sectors where we just no longer will be competitive. Um, but we can raise the cattle here, uh, we can, you know, that can be US ranchers, and then if it's taken through Mexico or Canada and slaughtered in those places, it can then be sent off and sent to those markets, which are huge markets, um, without the tariff. So that is a way that we can benefit from markets that we don't have access to. So I wanna ask one more question and then turn it over to you all to ask questions. What does the future look like? Is regionalism gonna to continue to be important? Is it going to be something that the US should really get in on now? Is it gonna change shape in the next couple of years? What do you think? So I see right now 
a second chance, frankly, for the United States. There are lots of factors swirling around today. Um, some of them have been in train for the last decade or more. We're seeing more automation in, in factories, uh, and that means that low wages don't matter quite as much. Capital does, and we have an advantage there. Uh, we see big changes in demographics. Uh, you know, lots of people flocked to China in the early 2000s because there were a lot of workers and it was cheap to, to build there. And now there are more Chinese leaving the labor force than entering every year. And prices aren't so good anymore. They're not, you know, they're not, it's not as cheap as it once was. Um, we see changes because of climate change. Uh, not only, you know, big disruptions in tsunamis and, and other, you know, natural disasters are affecting the movement of goods, um, but so are uh, companies beginning to calculate the cost of emissions. Um, and I think we'll see more and more of that as we go forward. So producing things far away adds an extra cost. Uh, and then, you know, we are seeing, especially since we're here in D.C. right now, we're seeing a lot of geopolitics here. And we're seeing the U.S. government, but also the Chinese government and Europe, too, in, in a sense, trying to distance the U.S. and Chinese economies, trying to decouple, at least in, in many sectors. And that, too, what all of this means together is we're seeing a once-in-a-generation fluid supply chain. So. CEOs, boards of directors, everybody's talking about their current footprint. Is this where we should stay? Where should we put our next factory? Do we want to put it here? Do we want to change where we're going? And what I think we'll see, not every industry, because there are huge benefits to producing in China or in Asia or in Europe and the like, but I do think we will see uh, a more of movement to regionalism, a more of a sense of if we're going to supply the U.S. market, to make sure it's profitable, to make sure that we have access to it. We need to produce closer by, maybe in the US or maybe in, in adjacent countries. Uh, I think we'll see the same thing in, in Asia. You know, as you look at the next 10 years, you know, the next billion consumers that are gonna become middle class, most of them are gonna be in Asia. So some people will say, you know what, we're gonna leave this region, we're gonna go over there because that's where the money's gonna be or that's where we think our client's gonna be down the road. So I think we're seeing a lot of movement here and this gives the US a chance, in my view, to get back in the game where, where it's been a little bit slower, it's been caught on its back foot, because it is a way to bring companies back to this side of the ocean, from either side, from the Atlantic or from, from the Pacific. Um, but I would say, if the US tries to reshore everything and bring it just to the United States, um, it will lose out, because it will just be too profitable to keep an international supply chain. So it'll be better to make everything in, one, in a place where you can work together with countries rather than just bring it all back just for the US market. Hmm. Great, so if anyone has questions, um, can come up, I get think, to these microphones. Sure, we'll start on the left. Hi, uh, Roy Gutman from the Baltimore Council. Uh, can you give us a kind of an overview of what happened during the Trump administration? There were so many uh, machinations with uh, with tariffs, with uh, uh, you know, especially we, we rewrote NAFTA, uh, rejected, as you say, the Pacific uh, Agreement. Um, on, you know, on the whole, did it benefit uh, the U.S. and did it benefit trade, or did it benefit Trump, or you know, was there really a logic to it? Sure. Well. Um I think the logic sometimes got muddied, but we did see concrete actions. And I think one of the biggest actions by the Trump administration was putting in tariffs across a whole set of uh, goods coming in from China and escalating ones that went up almost to, you know, depending on the, on the type of good, um, up to 25%. So a huge hit for things coming from China. Um, interestingly, this has changed trade in many ways. Um, and so you have seen, for instance, just one example, the electronics industry. If you look at before the Trump tariffs, four out of every $10 of imports in electronics coming into the United States were coming from China. It was, you know, not even more than four, almost, you know, half were coming from China. That has fallen dramatically to less than a third now come from China. Um, so, you know, you have seen these kinds of tools, whether it's tariffs or export controls or, you know, different kinds of, of uh, regulations of maritimes, it, it does uh, put frictions in trade and does cause uh, various types of companies or industries to decide to move elsewhere. Now, in that example, and this is where I think the U.S. has frankly been caught on the back foot, you had a punitive measure, right? You had a tariff, um, but you didn't have any carrots. <laughs> um, and to, to 
invite or entice those industries to come back here or to come closer by, say, to North America. Um, so yes, you've seen a fall from you know, 43 cents, 42, 43 cents out of every dollar of electronics coming to the United States, coming from China to down to 31 cents or so. Um, but all of that went to Southeast Asia. None of it came to, to North America. Um, and so I think as I look forward, if I was going to, you know, humbly make some suggestions to the Biden administration or the new Congress that's coming in, is that you can't just have sticks, you have to have carrots, right? You have to have, if you want to, this reshuffle to go our way and, and to see more production that happens across, you know, Western Hemisphere production platforms, you have to also entice them back, not just push them out of China. Um, but, but those, and those tariffs continue today. So I think there are certain industries that have just decided wholesale it was time to move out of China. And some of that, frankly, when I was doing research for the book, um, I traveled around there and talked with various, you know, folks in the industry and supply chain managers. Some of that was already starting to happen. Um, it was starting to happen because, you know, labor costs weren't as low as they used to be, and some businesses really went there for low labor costs. Others found, you know, frictions in trade, or, or some of the things actually that the Chinese government were making it a bit more difficult to work day in and day out for particular industries. And so they felt, you know, let's go to somewhere else that makes it easier for us to, to do the kinds of things that we want to do. Um, so I think you already saw some movement, but, but I do think Trump tariffs made a huge difference, particular industries like, especially low margin industries where, you know, profits aren't that big. It's, it's you know, it's a pretty competitive industry. You just, you can't have a 10% tariff or, or a 25% tariff and, and still make money, so you see them move out. Let's go over here to the right. Hi, my name is Jonathan and I'm a volunteer here with the World Affairs Council. I'm also a student. Thank you for your service. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also, I also happen to be a student in international relations and speaking purely anecdotally, I can tell you that I've taken several classes on globalization and on, on regionalization. So I, was, so I was hoping if you could uh, speak a little on how uh, academia is so much of a focus on globalization specifically and not much on something like regionalization, uh, like how globalization has such a stranglehold on modern academia. It's a good question, but now maybe, maybe I need to go get a job in one of these places. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think this idea of globalization has sort of captured all of our academic and, and the media and the like and it, it's not that it hasn't happened I'm not saying that we don't see we do see globalization we do see movement across borders we do see people moving and ideas moving and, and money moving um, but more often than not the money and the trade and the goods and the services go closer by than not and so I think that gets hidden a little bit in, in these conversations and um, I could go real super academic-y on you and say, well, there's this guy, Thomas Kuhn, who has this idea of paradigms, and everybody fits into this paradigm until somebody breaks the paradigm. It's sort of like a very uh, theory of science kind of stuff that academics talk about. But, but to get away from that sort of way of describing it, I think there's something real to globalization, right? We all, we all see that we have goods that say, oh, it's made in China. Oh, okay, so that must be, um, that's, that's globalization, right? Or we see, you know, TV shows or other things that come from all over the world, right? With Netflix, everybody watched Squid Games. That's from South Korea. Wow, okay, that's globalization, right? We see this, or Hollywood movies go the other way. And so there are examples of this for sure. And so I think that's what we grab onto. Um, I also think some of this interchange, it's, it's smaller companies. It's not so high profile. It's, it's sort of the back and forth um, that, that we don't see as much. And then the other thing I would say is, much of the regionalization force um, has happened in Asia. Um, and you look at Asia in 1980, less than 30% of the trade and the money flows were going around Asia. And you look today, it's over 60%. So a lot of this huge transformation, both opening of their economies, which we've seen where trade is a bigger part of their economy, but also their connections to their other countries is within Asia. It's not so much here, right? If you look at Trade between the United States and its neighbors in 1990, it was about 40%. Uh, through, after NAFTA, you saw it rise up to 47, 48%, so almost half. And then in the 2000s, it went back down to 40%. So this is not a region that has regionalized. And I, you know, I think our media and sometimes our academics tend to focus on what we know. And what we know is not regionalization, right? Globalization. But it's the rest of the world, particularly Asia and Europe, um, that, have, that have taken on this these ties and commercial links and institutional links and money links and people links 
And I do think that has made them more commercially successful. That's where you see some of, uh, some of the competition we face. Right? We're not facing competition from China. We're facing competition from Asia. Um, and, and that's a challenge. But I do think the, the short answer is I think the US um, academic departments need to think a little bit more. There needs to at least be an elective on, on regionalization. <laughs> Hi. Steve Lackey from Pittsburgh. Um, you mentioned that trade has been growing faster than GDP and it has global yeah. GDP, and that's been true since post World War II. A lot of that though, has also been predicated on multilateral institutions. First gap, well, not so much an institution, but yeah. an agreement. But then that was followed by the World Trade Organization, the World Intellectual Property Organization. And even you can even say that part of the future growth is going to be dependent on companies' actions or global actions toward sustainability, which will then relate to the UN's 17 Sustainable, sustainable Development Goals. Oh. What do you think are the challenges for multilateral institutions going forward? And is that going, and is nationalism going to inhibit their ability to, and the ability to grow trade in the future? Yeah. I do worry about the, the WTO and these other institutions that, that are supposed to lay the ground rules for this that you're talking about. And I worry for two reasons. One is the one you name, which is the nationalism and, and the, in the, you know, the politics, and particularly right now, you know, in a big global institution like that, you have you know, a war between Ukraine and Russia, you have tensions with the US and China, um, and, and you know, Russia and Europe and the like, and so these, these institutions are paralyzed. Nobody can come up to a decision, whether it's the WTO or the UN or other places. But as I look at the frictions in, in trade around the world today, um, the other challenge that they have is many of the things that you need to lessen to, to improve trade and to make global supply chains work better and, and be more efficient and the like um, are things that the WTO just isn't designed to take on, right? And they're one of the main things is subsidies. Um, and you've seen over just the last decade, uh, or um, I guess decade to 15 years, you've seen almost 20,000 subsidies put in place between China, US, and the EU. Um, just those, those three blocks of countries, right? And so that, the WTO really isn't designed to be able to take those on. And what you've seen in, in place have been regional free trade agreements. So that gets back to the regional element. If the WTO is insufficient or, or not really working, as the case may be right now, countries have turned to regional free trade agreements or, or you know, smaller groupings of, of groups. And I see, as I look at the next decade, I think we're just gonna see more and more of these you know, coalitions of the willing, of friend shoring, of ally shoring, or of these regional trade agreements setting the rules. So some places and agreements will have you know, no tariffs, or they'll have, you know, you can, government procurement, you can bid on contracts if you know, if you're in Japan, you can bid on ones in South Korea and the like, um, but countries like the United States will, be, will not be able to do that because they're not gonna be part of this, these agreements, like, you know, there's a whole bunch of them and acronyms are all out there, but there's, you know, a number of Asian ones, there's Europe has been signing agreements all over the world, Africa has signed, a, you know, continental agreement. You're seeing the world divide up into these and really trade be governed by rules set by these more regional agreements or, or smaller grouping agreements than, than the WTO. And that, to me, is where I think it's not the best case solution, but I think that's where we're headed realistically. Hi, um, my name is Veronica. I'm a student and also a current intern with the Waka National Headquarters Office. And so my question is really regarding, um, yeah, how the US can kind of further engage with North America, with just the Latin American region. And so I was wondering how effective you think some of these kind of like conferences or just dialogues and so for example one thing that comes to mind is um, the summit of the Americas that happened this past summer and a lot of the controversy surrounding that and um, who was invited to attend the conference and who wasn't and especially with um, Mexico's president AMLO refusing to go because of that um, how do you do you think those, those kind of conferences like are effective do you think that that is like having those sit down dialogues are the step first step for the U.S. being, you know, the big power it is in the Western Hemisphere to be able to reach out to these other countries and kind of start creating those connections for further trade and regionalization. So I think conferences, dialogues, they're important, right? They're frustrating and they're slow and they're a lot of, often just a photo op, but you, you need to talk with each other, right? And I think that part is important. And I would say actually the Summit of the Americas, on a total side note, 
AMLO was never going to come. AMLO has never gone to any of these. He's never shown up at the UN General Assembly. He did not attend the G20. He's never attended the G20. He didn't attend the one that just happened. He's just, he's not an international travel. He's not an international summit guy. So it, he was never going to come. But, um, but these are important. I would say actually the Summit of the Americas, a few things came out that are positive if we see gets in traction out of them. One was um, we saw a commitment by many countries in the region to deal, um, to begin to work together on regional migration. Um, and you know, we talk a lot about the migration to the U.S. southern border, and, and there's lots of challenges there. Um, but there are millions of people moving around the Western Hemisphere, and many other countries who have had to deal with bigger flows of migrants in absolute terms, and definitely in relative terms to their populations. Um, and and you know, working together to sort of think about the flows of these people and making sure that they're managed but in humane ways, I think is a huge part. So I think that was important. That's a little tangential to some of this stuff, but you know, people are in the end, we haven't talked about you know, talent and people, but that is also a huge part of, of the global economy and, and prosperity and, and just, you know, in the end it's people that you wanna make their lives better, right? It's not just that you wanna make lots of stuff. Um, so, so that what came out of it. The other thing that was announced there that they're still trying to figure out, but I think has some legs is um, the APEP, it's the American Partnership for Economic Prosperity. In true you know, US uh, governmental form, there's a gazillion acronyms that are, don't roll off the tongue easily. But, um, but this is the idea of how do you increase commerce within the Western Hemisphere? And you know, one interesting thing, like I, so I mentioned that the US doesn't have a lot of free trade agreements around the world, and that's true. The strong majority of the ones they have are actually in the Western Hemisphere. There's a dozen countries that actually have free trade agreements in the Western Hemisphere. We just have very few with the rest of the world. So this region already has this basis of, you know, basically no tariffs, lesser regulation, wi willingness to work together. And so that's something to build on, frankly. And as we decide, you know, we don't want lots of industries or particular technologies we don't want produced in certain countries because we're worried about access and the like, you know, China being the focus here. Okay, where are we going to bring those back, right? If we're going to bring back semiconductors, okay, great. We will make the semiconductors here, but who's going to do the packaging and testing? Are we going to do that here too, or can we find other countries to do that? Because right now China does almost all of it in the world. So if, if we want to bring back the, the foundries that are making the chips, we also need to have the whole process here. And there I think there's, there's space to talk with other countries in the Western Hemisphere because by geographic reasons, there's benefits to bring it closer. You don't have you know, the shipping and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's not so close that you have vulnerabilities to, you know, a hurricane that hits all of the industry. So I think there's, there's areas there, and, you know, the only way you get this done is, you know, conversations that may not be at those summits, but you got to start at the summits, and then you go on and have other conversations, I would say. Hello. Uh, my name is Saria Dodi. I'm one of the student scholars here. Naples Council on World Affairs, and this is a little bit in the same vein of a previous question, but in a lot of my classes as a political science major, we do talk about globalization as this, you know, overarching force that defines international relations, but I think that's largely in part due to the cultural aspect of it and the way that we see communication systems and social media kind of pushing this cultural scope of globalization. And so I'm wondering, do you believe that you know, the economic side of things is impactful on the cultural scope if they are independent of one another or if they are the result of each other? So both of those have gone international. Um, I do think that when you look at the trade and that's part, it's, it is more regional. Um, but I think there's a regional element, if not as strong, to some of the cultural. Um, in, in some ways. Um, and you know, you see this in, in Asia, you know, you see WeChat and others being, you know, you, we don't have WeChat or, or, well, I actually did have it on a phone at one point, but you don't have that as much here in the United States, right? You're not sitting there, you know, talking to each other. You're probably talking on WhatsApp or you're talking on, you know, whatever, text. Um, so some things have a regional element, but if you're in Singapore, you might be on WeChat, right? You might be, so I think there's some element there to the cultural side. You see it a little bit in the movies, um, you know, some, you know, it, you're trying to export, you know, U.S. movies to to Asia, and some of them hit, and some of them do not hit at all. And, and they're trying to figure out what people actually like. Um, and then there's all these great examples of, of you know, I have some in the book, but just because I think they're so funny, um, of of U.S. companies or Western companies trying to sell into these markets, and and especially their cultural touchstones being being way off, right? Like one of my favorites is Pepsi had this this campaign 
in, in China. Um, and in the US, it was like the, the tagline was something like, um, you know, waking a new generation or something. That was it. And, and in China, nobody wanted to drink Pepsi because the, the translation was, we'll bring your ancestors back from the dead. <laughs> like, so, <laughs> you know, like, doesn't quite work. So, um, so I don't think culture always, always, you know, translates exactly. Um, but there is something to that, right? There is something to, to this opening up. We definitely see an internationalization um, of that. Um, but I, I think this goes back to look, globalization. I'm not saying globalization is, is a total that has never happened because it, because it has, of course, right? Um, what's interesting to me is I do think this stronger force is, is sort of what's closer. Um, and in some ways with social media and the like, um, you almost see a reinforcing in some ways, a different, on one side you have access to information from all over the world, on the other side, it tends to, to shrink down to just particular groups. Um, you actually may not hear the, the you know, a, a, a lots of different points of view that you might have if it wasn't quite so prevalent. And, and just on a hard database, or, or sort of data facts, when you look at information flows that go abroad, they too tend to follow this sort of regional aspects, you know, Google searches or, you know, downloads of music or, or movies or Netflix. They too tend to be a little bit more regional than we would even think. Hey there, I'm uh, Max Garcia with uh, World Organ here as one of the students. Um, and I was just wondering, I think you mentioned earlier that globalism in some aspects has left behind a large part of the global south, whether that be Latin America or Africa or South or Southeast Asia. Uh, to what degree do you think regionalism, kind of as opposed to globalism, might widen or decrease that gap? Yeah, I mean, I talk about, you know, the U.S. has a second chance. I think these other parts of the world have a second chance, too. And, and what international supply chains brought to, you know, the cases we can look at, like the Taiwans or South Korea, who in 1960s were desperately poor countries, right? And today, you know, they make semiconductors and they have very high and they have all these engineers, but they were desperately poor and they were able to change. What supply chains allow you to do is by bringing in, by, by getting part of this chain, by taking a part here, you get technology transfers, you get things like expertise brought in, managerial, how, like, how do you set up a factory? What's the best way to do it? You get all these kind of expertise that are brought to your society and then you can leverage that and, and be kind of climb what they call the value added chain. Be, you, know, you start off you know, sewing buttons on things and then later on you're making, you have the patents for synthetic fabrics, which is you know, a big business. Um, so that's kind of the, the ideal way that supply chains work. And what places like Latin America and Africa have, because they have not regionalized, because they've not turned to each other, um, and you look at these places and less than 15% of their trade is with their neighbors. So if they send things abroad, they send it far away. What ends up happening is you end up on the two ends of the supply chain. You send out raw materials, you know, oil or soy, and then you bring back the finished goods. Um, but you don't get to this middle part that actually allows you to learn new skills and become more sophisticated. You sort of end up on these ends. And the reason you don't get this part is because you're too far away from sort of the, you know, the, the other parts that are happening because you're not doing it with each other. And, you know, this is one of the big challenges. Like I was talking to someone uh, who, who works with Apple. Um, and at one point, Apple was trying to bring back to, to the United States, or to, the, to North America, the making of one of the laptops. And they were gonna set up in, in Texas and that was gonna be the main facility and they were going to, you know, make it here. And, and literally, they stopped doing it and setting up the supply chain in North America for want of a little screw that like goes on the back of the thing that screws in the back of your laptop. They just didn't have any suppliers. But in Asia, there's suppliers all over. And so the challenge for an Africa or Latin America is you have to set up everything from that little screw all the way to the processor. I mean, you have to have that whole chain, and that's what Asia has been able to do. And if you don't turn to each other, you're just not going to be able to do that. You're not going to send you know, one part to Argentina or one part to Nigeria and then send it all the way back. It's just not the way it works. So, so I do think they have a chance this time around. OK, let's, let's connect. But you have to connect with each other. And they haven't done that yet. Let's squeeze in these last two questions okay. here. Yeah. Good morning. Um, Good morning. I'm Jack Pernick with the Western Massachusetts World Affairs Council. I want to ask you a little bit about the structure of free trade agreements. So yeah. most countries, they go to enter into a free trade agreement. If they want to leave it, they want to break it. It's a diplomatic matter. In the US, if we go through the proper process, we 
codify that into our domestic law. And so I'm curious if that creates some structural reticence to the U.S. joining free trade agreements, and if so, what can we do to kind of blunt that effect and make sure that it doesn't inhibit us from joining an agreement that would otherwise be beneficial? Um, sure. Well, we, you know, it's interesting um, because our process is a little bit onerous and you go through this whole process, we've seen more than one government tried to do things through executive decrees, right? So some of the stuff, the Trump administration, they're like, we're not gonna take it through Congress, we're gonna, ta we're gonna do it here. And then uh, previous ones have as well, right? The Bush administration, Obama administration, little things that they've changed by not going through Congress. Um, you know, the different countries do this in different ways. In some places, treaties that you sign are above national law and even above the Constitution. Like, so for Mexico, for instance, the treaties they sign, like the USMCA, it's above all the other laws, which is right now the US and, and Canada have some quibbles with Mexico on various issues. And so this is an issue. It's above the laws that they've passed in their country. Um, so some places it's, it's, it's quite codified in, in the US. Um, it, it, treaties are, are you know, very solid as well, and partly why we don't sign them. We call them agreements instead of treaties and things because of these legal codifications. Um, what does it mean for the U.S., um, or how do, where do we go forward on trade policy like that? Um, look, I would hope, um, I'm ever hopeful, I'm an optimist by nature, but right now we have a, a, a you know, I would say a time when, when people from both parties, or leadership in both parties, are, are pretty suspicious of trade, and, and we sort of hear that. But when you look at polls of the average American, a strong majority of Americans actually think trade is an opportunity, not a threat. So I think actually people in the United States understand this, but, but some of our leadership, it isn't translating um, up, up to you know, our leadership and the way we're thinking about these. And, and not every free trade agreement is going to be good, right? I think you have to design them in ways um, that are use, are that are beneficial to the United States. But what we do think, I think what our track record of the last 20, 30 years has shown is that when you have a free trade agreement that actually sets rules that people then have to follow and it has labor rights in it, has environmental issues, and like you're much more likely to benefit from it and also strengthen U.S. exports and companies than when you do not have a free trade agreement, which we do not have with China, which we do not have limits on the subsidies they provide to companies to move there or the way that they work, you know, environmental rules or labor rules and the like. So actually setting up those rules is much more likely that our companies, which for lots of reasons need to follow a certain set of rules and standards, um, to you know to succeed and let me actually let me tell you one this is to me very hopeful when i was doing research for this book um so uh you know we think about like globalization race to the bottom and all of this but when i was looking at europe um do you all know you probably know the brand zara right you've seen the stores and you've bought their clothes or your kids have bought their clothes or, or what have you so zara is now the biggest fast fashion brand in the world that sells half a trillion dollars worth of goods every year it is also the most profitable fast fashion brand in the world. So it beats out all the other ones, you know, H&M or Gap or na name your company. And the way it does this is by making everything in Europe and not Asia. So it has found a way to become the biggest and most profitable um, at, in, in a market, in, in a, you know, market that is high, high wages, high labor protections, environmental standards, and it's able to dominate the most cutthroat of global industries. Um, it does this through a mix of automation and making small batches and getting things to stores faster and not having to discount because it turns things over faster because it doesn't have to wait two, three months for something to get across in a container ship. It can get to the stores right away. But it's an interesting, you don't have to race to the bottom. If there's a high, you know, a high benefit place, and that's where I think the United States can end up as well. But you need your neighbors. It's not, not everything is made in Spain. Some of it's made in Romania and Hungary and Portugal and other places as well. Okay. I'd like to go back to, uh, the, uh, my name is Ed Mountains from World Boston, and I'd like to go back to the, you talk about semiconductors and how sometimes there's a reason you have to look beyond just the trade aspect there. We found out recently that, and I don't know the technology behind this, I've been marketing and sales, so I have no knowledge at all of anything. But, um, <laughs> so, that's what, <laughs> but um, they, they, what we, what they found out is that apparently some semiconductor is absolutely vital to our economy for everything. And maybe exaggerating, again, I don't. We I wouldn't be so talking on these microphones. If yeah, we exactly, yeah. we'd be doing hands, so we'd do charades right now. Exactly. So. <laughs> And it, said, and, and, and it found that they were made in like two factories in you know, Taiwan or something. Yeah. And that's why all of a sudden anybody just walks up, we got a problem. So I was wondering if, if there's an aspect there too, that sometimes there is a, a, a national, so you call it, it 
a national security aspect to bringing this stuff back, too. Thank you. No, thank you. I spent many years in Boston, so nice to see you. Um, there, there is. Uh, and, you know, one of the biggest shifts, I would say, over this last five or so years is we're seeing a rise in return of industrial policy. And countries around the world are deciding that they need to intervene in their economy for lots of reasons, for climate reasons, um, but for national security reasons. And I think some of these are, are justified. You look at semiconductors, which power everything in our economy, and, and you know we'd barely be able to probably open the doors to get out if we didn't have semiconductors. Uh, our car sure wouldn't run. Um, and all of them are made, or vast majority are made by uh, TSMC, which is the Taiwan Semiconductor Company. Um, I mean, there's some in South Korea as well, but there's, there's real dominance, and particularly in certain sectors that depend, the defense industry depends on, and, and so the very high technology are made elsewhere. So I think there is a reason to want access um, here and geographically and or where, um, you know, where we feel they're allies. The, the other part here too is while the foundries or the place where the actual chips are made are in Taiwan, um, lots of the packaging and testing, the thing that actually makes it so that we can use it happens in China. Um, and, and so there's parts there too. If we, just, if we believe that China is a national security threat, that they could just shut that door. Um, the other side too, that China processes all of the raw materials that go to Taiwan to make these things. So they would just decide we're not going to sell these anymore to anything that the U.S. is going to make, or we're not going to finish the packaging, then we wouldn't have access to those. And you could imagine, you know, kind of doomsday scenarios where that would happen. So, so I think there are national security reasons where to intervene. I think the, the last thing I'll say, um, the challenge is you want to make sure that's not so broad um, that everything becomes a national security issue. Because in the end, you know, we U.S. taxpayers only have so much money that we can provide to the U.S. government to do that. And you, there's a cost to intervening in the markets. I mean, the markets are not perfect, and I think the governments and, and others need to, to guide them so that they reach good outcomes, um, both in terms of competition, but also in terms of social benefits and the like. Um, but not everything can be a national security interest. So maybe semiconductors are a big one, uh, probably electric vehicle batteries and the technology for the green transition, that's probably another one. Um, you know, we can point to a couple of others, but, you, but I do think the core, what makes the United States so great, and you look at the histories of innovation and the like, is the U.S. government was involved in a lot of money there, right? And particularly basic research, that sort of quixotic find that in, invents, you know, all kinds of, you know, biotechnologies or the internet and things. But then it's private companies that take it off and run with it and, 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 and make them into the products we have today. And some people will say, well, the U.S. government should have part of that. It's like, well, hopefully the U.S. government has part of that when those companies make billions of dollars and pay their taxes back. Not if they relocate to Ireland for tax reasons, but let's say they stay here. Then that, you know, that's where the benefit